Welcome to WordPress Accessibility Day. My name is Carrie Dills and I am a WordPress developer and instructor. You're tuned in to a session with Bella Gaetan who will share Beyond Colors and Captions, how to provide more inclusive accessibility. So if anybody's got questions, feel free to add those during the presentation. There's a Q&A tab in Slido and we'll address those questions at the end of the session. You can also use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. <clears throat> Please allow me to introduce Bella. Uh, Bella Gaitan is a technical instructor designer at Pantheon, community and social media manager for the e-learning designers community and academy, WordPress web developer, and an advocate for underrepresented groups. She holds a match, <clears throat> She holds a Bachelor of Business in Human Resource Management and a Master of Education in Learning and Technology. Known for her authenticity, transparency, and vulnerability, she disrupts spaces to create change. She uses her lived experience and intersectional identities as someone who is a Latina, neurodivergent, queer, visually impaired, and physically disabled. Leveraging the power of these experiences, Bella builds communities, nurtures social connections, and educates folks on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Welcome, Bella. It's great to have you. Hi, Carrie and everyone. So wonderful to be here. You nailed my name, so good job. I, I love that. Um, as Carrie said, I'm Bella Gaitan. My pronouns are she and her. And today I'm going to be presenting on what I call inclusive accessibility, thinking beyond colors and captions. So we will jump right into it. Um, disclaimer, most of my stuff is really interactive. Um, so I will be looking at the chat quite often to see if I'm able to see anything pop up, but please feel free to ask questions. Always love that. So I'm gonna jump right in here. So meet me, Bella. Uh, most of this on the screen, uh, Carrie already covered, except for the final second to last one that says, I love coffee, plants, laughing, and cats. And you may see my cat make an appearance. Um, there's a picture of me here, but I will go ahead and give a visual description of myself now. I am a light-skinned Latina. I have short, dark, curly blue hair, light blue-green eyes. Um, I'm wearing a, I think it's turquoise. Uh, I am colorblind, so... It is like a turquoise floral top with a bunch of dots, strangely reminiscent of a colorblind test. I find that kind of ironic. Um, I have tattooed sleeves behind me. You'll see a soothing green wall and lots of plant babies. So let's jump right into this, my friends. So let's start with who benefits from accessibility. So the first group that we'll talk about, people with mobility impairments benefit from accessibility. LGBTQIA plus folks benefit from accessibility. Before I, before I, you know, hear people saying, wait, what? Being queer, being lesbian, being gay, it's not a disability. I know, but just bear with me. I promise I will bring it around full circle and explain why that's included in here. Other people that benefit from accessibility are those with visual impairments, persons who are deaf or hard of hearing or have uh, speech impairments can benefit from accessibility, individuals with intellectual disabilities benefit from accessibility. Um, this is a photo of me with my uncle Norby, one of my most favorite people in the world, and he is intellectually disabled and very happy to be part of this, uh, this session. And finally, everyone benefits from accessibility. Everyone, 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 not just people that are disabled, not just people that ask for accommodations, and we'll go over that. So when we're talking about disabilities, I, I really would like for everyone to think or to realize, I guess, that you can't be inclusive if, if you're not accessible. Let me say that again, you cannot be inclusive unless you are accessible. So disabilities and inclusion need to go hand in hand. And when we're talking about disabilities, we're focusing on four main categories here. We're talking about visual disabilities, hearing and speech disabilities, physical disabilities, and cognitive disabilities. 
And then at the center is that sweet spot where I really try to just focus on not only disabilities, but also being inclusive in accessibility. And I call that inclusive accessibility. Not a very unique name, but it's, I'll keep it. <laughs> So we're going to start and we're just going to go through all the different categories and I'm going to talk about the different types of disabilities and then the design considerations uh, to keep in mind. So, and I will give a, another disclaimer as well. I am neurodivergent. Um, I do have some cognitive issues. Sometimes I may not say the right word or it comes out, you know, differently. I will try to rephrase myself if there's anything that anyone does not understand. Um, and I do kind of move around a lot, so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> All right, so we'll start with visual. So types of visual disabilities, partial or total vision loss, low vision, color blindness. And now I wanna remind you all that it's not just people that have permanent disabilities that need accessibility. So other situations before I continue, you know, let's talk about temporary disabilities, situational disabilities. Um, and so when we're talking about visual disabilities, someone could have just had their eyes dilated uh, at an optometrist or ophthalmologist's office, and they're just not able to have that depth perception and vision that they're used to. Um, someone may have painful eyes from allergies or infections or just sensitive eyes, you know? And then there's others that have light sensitivity. So when you're thinking about designing for people to be able to accommodate those that have visual needs, you want to ensure that the colors have enough contrast. Um, there's no such thing as an inaccessible color, but you do have inaccessible color combinations. So if, if you look at my colors, um, because I'm colorblind, I tend to go for colors that have a lot of contrast just naturally without really running it through a checker. But you know, let's say the the top bar where it's black instead was maybe like a, let's say like a tan color. The yellow probably would not be accessible against that because it just would not provide enough contrast. The white definitely wouldn't. So, you know, just ensuring that your colors have enough contrast between them, um, including alt text for images, allowing users the ability to zoom in on content using text instead of images for text. So some of you that are as old as I am, I'm gonna take you back here. Do you remember back in the, the original MySpace days and uh, GeoCities, I think before Yahoo bought them? Um, and if you remember back then, there were a lot of websites that offered you the ability to like put in some text and then you could style it. It would have like flames coming out or bubbles coming up. I know I'm not the only one that used those, right? So something like that, although it looks really cool, if you're adding an image like that to a site, it's someone that's using a screen reader is not gonna know what that says. So you wanna really be careful about using text, or I'm sorry, using an image of text instead of you know adding the actual text on there. Um, but if you use that sparingly, it's okay. Just make sure you add the alt text in there, right? Um, the other thing is not relying on color alone to convey information. Classic example of that would be, you know, if you have a red stop and a green go button, someone that's colorblind like myself, if there's no other indication as to, you know, what are the purposes of each button, it kind of defeats the purpose there. Um, having clear and concise page titles, link text, headings and labels, this will really help people, especially that use screen readers so that they can navigate quickly and efficiently to the area that they're wanting to get to. And finally, visual descriptions in events. I have had some people talk to me and tell me that they feel uncomfortable describing themselves. And most of the people that I talk with, they say that, you know, they, part of it is just uh, not having enough how do I want to say it? Not self-love, but I guess just confidence to describe themselves. And while that is valid, and I know a lot of people struggle with self-image, it's really important to provide those visual uh, descriptions when you're in live events. You can be as detailed or as vague as you want. I could just say, you know, hi, I'm Bella. I am a woman with short hair and a um, dressy top. 
personally, I like to be more detailed because I feel like when I talk about my ethnicity and the plants behind me, it just kind of gives it that extra added, I guess, personality to it. And I feel like I let people have a more equitable experience because I'm trying to let them imagine everything that they can see here that everyone else is able to see, if that makes sense. All right. So moving away from visual, let's go to hearing and speech. Uh, this is a photo of myself and my dad. Um, I am colorblind. My dad is colorblind and my dad is also deaf in one ear. So I felt it was pretty cool to be able to put us here on this slide. Um, I also uh, have a speech impediment that I've had to have uh, speech therapy for. So it's like we were meant for this slide, right? So when we're talking about hearing and speech uh, disabilities, we're talking about someone who's deaf or hard of hearing, such as my dad being deaf in one ear. Um, people that stutter, people that have speech sound disorders, as I did as a child. But then also we want to think about, you know, something like throat cancer. Or what if someone has strep throat? I've never had strep throat, knock on wood, but I've heard that it is extremely painful and I hope I never get it. Um, someone with an ear infection, you know, those, those types of things that are going to affect your hearing and possibly your speech. So design considerations for this group of folks would be number one, to allow communication options. So you would want to not only allow people, let me rephrase that. I'll give you a really good example of who does this well, Duolingo, the language app. When you're in Duolingo, if you're not able to speak as part of your lessons, you can push a button that says, I'm not able to speak. They also have one for listening where you can push a button that says, I'm not able to listen. And although that is I think geared towards able-bodied folks and just being in a public place, it's also a really great, great way to accommodate people that may have issues with hearing or may have speech and, you know, issues with talking in that moment. So allowing different communication options, um, you know, allowing people to type, not making people speak on a microphone during uh, Zoom meetings and stuff like that. Um, the other thing is provide captions on video and audio. This one is pretty good. And it's kind of why I've titled this talk Beyond Colors and Captions, because I think colors and captions are the main things that folks tend to focus on when they think about accessibility. Um, but that is always helpful. Uh, my dad likes to have the subtitles on because it allows him to better, you know, be able to hear what's going on the TV since he does have one ear that's um, completely deaf. Um, my son and I are both neurodivergent and we like to have the subtitles on. It's just this like sensory thing, I guess, that we like to have both of those going on where we can see the words and be able to, um, to see, you know, what's going on on the television as well. And another very important thing I want you to think about, don't assume that all deaf folks know sign language. So I will use my dad as an example. He's deaf in one year. He has never learned sign language. Um, the deafness was from him getting the mumps as a child. So it's not going to spread into the other ear. I have a very good friend. You may all know her, Meryl Evans. She is a phenomenal human being, um, a wonderful advocate. She's deaf and she lip reads. She does not know sign language. So not everyone who's deaf is going to be able to lip read. Not every person that's deaf is going to be able to sign. You need to, you know, find out what folks need in order to best accommodate them and don't make assumptions. All right, so let's move on to physical. So when we're talking about physical disabilities, um, these are also known as like, you know, mobility disabilities or impairments. We're talking about things such as, you know, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. I think that's also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, someone that is partially or fully paralyzed. Someone that has arthritis. People with connective tissue disorders. Someone who has a broken hand or maybe someone that had a recent surgery. Um, I will use myself as an example again. If you guys are noticing a theme here, 
I rely very heavily on lived experience because I think that's so important when we're talking about disabilities and accessibility and listening to the voices of people who have gone through it, you know. So um, I have a rare connective tissue disorder and uh, essentially my collagen throughout my entire body is weak. It's a genetic defect. There's nothing you can really do about it. It's progressive. It's degenerative. But one of the things that really bothers me as a lot is I am hypermobile in all of my joints. So I overextend with every movement. And sometimes when I'm typing, you know, after a couple hours or so, my fingers have just kind of had it, you know, and I have to take a break. Um, it's the same thing with walking or doing any kind of, you know, repetitive uh, motions. I have to really work on conserving my energy. Um, I'll give another example in terms of like a situational or temporary disability. My mom recently had to have um, surgery on her shoulder and my family were dorks and we play Uno a couple times a week. We throw down and my dad, because my mom was having trouble holding all of her cards, he took, he went into his shop and got like some wood and made like a stand so that my mom could have it in front of her. She could set her Uno cards in there and nobody could see around it until she was able to, you know, play again without any assistance. So my dad hopped in and accommodated my mom's needs, which was really cool. Um, so when considering design, oops, let me go back. Wait, there we go. <laughs> I got a little click happy there. So when we're talking about design considerations, don't rely on input from just a mouse. Think about people that may have to use like voice to speech to be able to interact and they can't type or use a mouse. Um, when I was in Morocco, I met a wonderful painter who um, did not have the use of his arms or his hands. And he painted by putting a paintbrush in his mouth. And he used his phone the same way as well. He had like a stylus that he was able to use, you know, on his phone, just using, using his mouth. Um, avoid causing the user to excessively scroll and perform navigational clicks. This one, I don't believe I see it anywhere when I'm looking at different accessibility guidelines. And I feel like it should be there um, because a lot of people that have a lot of chronic pain, or if you imagine someone that is partially paralyzed, they have very little, you know, movement in their hands. Can you imagine how painful it is for this person to just have to like scroll, 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 scroll? I'll give you a perfect example. If you go to LinkedIn or any, I think it's mostly on LinkedIn, people will post one line of text, enter, 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 enter another line of text, enter, enter, enter. Well, it looks really cool. Can you imagine, I mean, how many times you have to scroll, scroll, scroll. And so I tell people, I understand it looks really cool. It makes a much more visual, visually, you know, appetizing, you know, post, but consider people that really have to, you know, ration their energy during the day. And, you know, sometimes I get to a point where I've gone through so many of those, I don't read the posts. And I have to just get off the computer because my hands are hurting too much. Um, so please be mindful of that. I, I understand wanting to be visually appealing, but just try to be mindful of any type of excessive movement or action that you know someone has to take. Um, also ensure that the content is compatible with multiple device layouts. So someone may be using a desktop, someone may be using a laptop, someone may be using a mobile phone, a tablet or any other type of like assistive device. Um, one of the things you want to keep in mind is to make sure that uh, you have it set up to be responsive. And what responsive means when you're talking about web development is that no matter the screen size, your content will adjust accordingly. Um, if you want to see responsiveness in action, go to a website, have it on full screen on your computer, and then gradually just start, you know, dragging the corner down and minimizing it. And as you do, you'll start to see things shift around. Um, typically, as you get smaller, you know, you take away a lot of the excessive stuff in the menu and stuff like that. Um, but when you're designing things, try to be responsive and make sure that the content will be compatible. 
And then also just offer multiple input methods. This is, you know, very similar to what we were talking about with people that are hard of hearing or have speech impairments. It just makes it a lot more easier for folks that have um, physical disabilities. All right, now cognitive. Again, here is a picture of my perfect Uncle Norby in his Selena hat with roses on it. And I don't know what his shirt says, but he's got all his bling on his uh, on his neck and he is looking super cool. So when we're talking about cognitive disabilities, we're talking about people that have intellectual disabilities, like my uncle. We're talking about people that have neurodivergence, which can be things like ADHD, autism, personality disorders, and other mental health uh, illnesses. And things like dyslexia and dyscalculia are cognitive disabilities. Someone who has memory loss, migraines, severe headaches, or someone that's had a concussion. Um, I have multiple things that, uh, that affect my cognitive abilities. So I do have ADHD. I am likely autistic and I have borderline personality disorder. I also have an undiagnosed brain disorder. I have multiple lesions in my brain and they do affect my cognitive abilities and my memory. So I'm getting, I'm special. I've got all this, you know, as my friends say, glitter going on in my head. Um, which makes it kind of, you know, it, it makes it difficult sometimes because I do have memory loss. Or as I said before, I struggle with trying to find words sometimes and they just won't come to me. Um, so whenever you're dealing with someone that has like a cognitive disability, you want to be really mindful about not overloading them and just making the content as accessible and easily digestible as possible. OK, so. One of the things I'm a huge advocate of is image descriptions. Now, that is different from alt text. Alt text is for people that have screen readers so that they can understand, you know, if an image is decorative or, you know, what is an image. Image descriptions are placed within the content. So the way that I do it is I put an image description at the end of my post. And so while my alt text for this one might say, uh, this is Bella's Uncle Norby. He is smiling. Um, that might be all that I put for the alt text. For the image description, I would go into more detail and I would say, you know, this is um, DJ Norby, as he likes to be called because he loves rap. He's wearing a uh, bucket hat with roses and a picture of Selena on them. He's wearing a blue sleeveless top. And he's got, you know, several necklaces around his neck. He's smiling and looking off to the side and he's happy. Why all of the extra fluff, Bella? Okay, let me explain. So for someone, again, I'll use my own lived experience. For someone like myself, I might not know what colors are in the photo. And sometimes I, I want to know that, you know. Um, other things, people that have neurodivergence, especially, they may not be able to tell what kind of mood a photo is supposed to um, represent. Perfect example, my uncle here is not smiling with his teeth. I don't smile with my teeth either. So to some people, you might look at him and think, is he upset? Is he confused? Is he contemplating something? Is he, you know, is he in pain? And so adding in like any type of emotion or feeling that's supposed to be represented in the photo really will be helpful to people that may not understand why a photo is attached to a certain, you know, piece of content. Um, so that's, that's the difference between alt text and image descriptions. And so you also want to avoid, um, or excuse me, you want to make sure that you use clear and concise language if you're too technical or too, can we say over professional or fancy with your words, um, it might look really cool to you on paper and you might think like, man, that looks awesome, right? Chances are though, the fancier and the fluffier you try to make your, um, your content, you're gonna lose folks. So just try to be really clear, concise, get to the point and, um, Try not to be ambiguous. So avoiding cognitive overload. 
perfect example of cognitive overload. I was in a Zoom session recently and the person came on and they had it set up so that there was a border like surrounding the frame of, you know, being able to view them. It had a looping video of stars in space and not just stars kind of sitting there, but like motion. Okay. And then there were also some little animations that would come in and out. And then <laughs> behind him, he had a very active uh, aquarium with lots of bubbles and stuff coming up. I had to leave after about 10 minutes because I just could not focus. There were so many things that I was looking at. I couldn't really focus on him every time I'd start seeing the, the video reloop and I'm seeing the bubbles in the background and everything. And it was just, it was way too distracting. So you want to be mindful of stuff like that for people that have cognitive disabilities. Um, provide context when it's not clear. I can go back again to my image description example, you know, just letting someone know like, hey, this is a picture of Norby and like he's he's happy and smiling at, I don't know, maybe there's a birthday cake and a beer in the background that would make him smile. Um, but just kind of give context when it might not be clear to people. Along with that, be very careful with sarcasm because a lot of people that have cognitive disabilities, sarcasm doesn't go over very well with them. I'm one of those people. And, you know, for some people, they may not stop and think, wait, are they being serious and, and reach out and ask the person that they may actually feel hurt or attacked or like, you know, they're just not in a safe, sp safe space for them. So try to provide context when something might not be clear. And then the final one, be engaging without being busy. Again, think back to the, the, um, the webinar example that I gave. You can be engaging but you don't have to be so busy. You know, I don't have to sit here and have a pinwheel in my hand with it blowing around and music in the background and flashing lights everywhere to, to get you to pay attention to me. Hopefully I am animated and interesting enough, but if I'm not, I accept uh, criticism and I will work on that. All right, my friends. So now we're to inclusive accessibility, what you've all been waiting for. So, I take accessibility further than just people who need accommodations. One of the biggest things that I'm an advocate for is that people deserve to be in a psychologically safe space. They deserve access to a psychologically safe space. I don't think I've ever heard people really focus on that before, but it's so important, right? Because, you know, people are very sensitive. People have emotions. People have traumas from their past. And we can't always know that. And so trying to be understanding and receptive and proactive to be able to provide a safe space for people is so important. So, so important. So let's talk about the groups that are often left out of accessibility. And again, these are not necessarily disabilities, but just people that you don't often see that need a psychologically safe space or need to be represented more in order to be inclusive and diverse in our accessibility efforts. So we're talking about LGBTQIA plus individuals. We're talking about immigrants and non-native speakers of whatever language you know your, your content is in. Um, those with mental health disorders, oftentimes these folks um, are left out in accessibility. And I, I am, I have lived experience with that. And, and I can definitely attest to that, that I don't think enough people focus, focus on mental health disorders when they're creating content. Um, I know we talked about neurodivergent folks, but I, so I still feel like, you know, we're left out quite a bit in accessibility. Um, people of color ignore my parentheses there that I forgot to delete. Um, Folks that wear religious clothing. So examples of that could be Muslims, Sikhs, um, Jews, you know, where you're able to look at someone and visually identify, you know, what, what their faith or what their religion is. Um, the elderly and plus size folks. And this beautiful picture in the center with two beautiful plus size people. 
How many times do you go to a website and you see photos of people that are plus sized or people that are elderly, right? Most of the times you go to these websites anywhere online and you typically see people that are in their 20s to 30s, people that are fit and people that are considered attractive. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So when we're talking about more inclusive design considerations, think about utilizing inclusive photos. Now, go beyond skin color. What really gets me, though, is that if you go to the different like stock photo websites and stuff and stuff like that, if you search for diverse or inclusive photos, the only thing that's going to be diverse and inclusive in most of them is skin color you'll see a group of people probably of a very similar age hanging out in a bar or in an office setting or on a sports team, right? You don't tend to see like a picture that shows a black child, a Latina that's in a wheelchair. You don't see like an elderly Asian man and like a plus sized trans person, like all in one photo, right? Like that's truly diverse and inclusive, but unfortunately we can't always find photos like that. So do your best, try to think of keywords that you can put in there and just try to imagine like that, you know, you want everybody to feel like they are represented in the content. We want people to look and feel like, Hey, that's kind of like me. Right. And not just, you know, because let's be honest, most of the pages and websites and content that we go to are what are considered to be attractive, 20 to maybe 35 year old white folks. That's what we tend to see. We need more diversity. We need more inclusion. We need to be able to represent everyone, make everyone feel welcome and represented, right? Another thing is to avoid using triggering language. Um, without referring to any triggering language, uh, just, just know that a lot of people have had traumatic pasts, right? A lot of people have had very painful experiences and traumas. And sometimes people will joke about those situations. It's not funny and it's not psychologically safe for someone that has gone through that trauma. Um, Another example in, in that area is sometimes we have some slang words that we use that they have another meeting and it's a very violent or traumatic meaning. Again, I don't want to say those, but let me use a very, let me use an example of like a, a slang. If you say like, oh, it's a piece of cake. If someone is not familiar with that phrase, they might think you're talking about a literal piece of cake. And for anyone here who's not familiar with that term, it just means like something's very easy. I have no idea why they came up with that because I don't think baking a cake is easy. But, you know, that that's just a good way to try to like analyze your words and, you know, just try to look at them and think, could that be taken another way? And if yes, is it going to be clear to the person? And also, could it be harmful? Could it, you know, be triggering for them? Um Let's see, where am I? Okay, use gender, gender neutral language. I will raise my hand and be the first to admit that I'm still working on that, especially with saying you guys. I'm originally from the North. I grew up saying you guys all the time. Never meant it to mean anyone that is only like a male or a man, um, but I'm trying to get better with that but just use gender neutral language. There's no need to say he or she, say they or them, if you don't know like the gender of someone or when you're creating content, unless you're creating like a specific persona, then just say they or them. So as an example, like if I were to describe this photo because I don't know the gender identity of these two people, I would just say like there are two people standing in an office together they are looking at each other and they are smiling. They and them, it always works. And then other things like when you're talking about gender, gender, that's, I struggle saying that, um, gender neutral language. 
is mailman, policeman. Um, trying to think of some other ones, you know, instead just say mail person or mail delivery person or, you know, police person or, you know, just something like that. Um, I say um a lot too. I'm noticing that. And I clicked again. Let me go back. I get click happy. I have to like move my fingers around. I think that's like the neurodivergence in me. Um, but avoid slang and jargon. I kind of talked about that before with like the piece of cake. Um, you have to remember that not everybody, you know, uses these phrases like that, or, you know, they might be non-native to the area or, you know, not a native speaker of the language. So, you know, try to avoid that stuff. But if you do want to use it, provide an explanation. I'll give a wonderful example. In one of my previous talks, I believe, I said something about a potluck dinner. If you had no idea what a potluck dinner was, you might think it's like with a big pot outside or something on a campfire and maybe people just bring whatever they want and throw it in and you hope you get lucky with a delicious meal, right? But a lot of people won't know what that is. So I explained to folks that a potluck dinner is basically, you know, a dinner where people each bring a dish and then everyone shares. So just, you know, if you want to use stuff like that, just explain it. Um, provide context for images and stories, and then explain acronyms, abbreviations, and terms that may not be well known by all. And looking at my time, and I think, good, I got like four minutes left and then time for questions. All right. So the importance of lived experiences. You might be wondering why I brought myself into the equation so much during this talk. It's not that I have an ego. It's not that I want to be the center of attention, but I have experience with all of this stuff. And I'm always talking to others that are disabled and have experience, you know, in inaccessibility and disability because we're experts. We are experts on our own conditions, on our bodies, on our needs. And so this is why I think it's so important to involve uh, people that have lived experiences and that require accessibility. Um, so using my own experiences, I have multiple rare genetic disorders. Um, they're progressive, degenerative, there's no cure. And the information that I get from my medical providers compared to the information that I get from others who have the same diseases as I do is very different because, you know, a medical professional is going by training alone, right? They're going by book knowledge or, you know, hands-on experience with someone telling them how they feel. But for those of us that have lived experience, like we're pros, we know what it feels like inside our body. We know what it feels like, you know, to, to deal with inaccessibility. Um, and our voices matter and we need more disabled folks out there kicking ass and being vocal about our lived experiences. Um, this photo is in Nashville a few years ago. It was at a, one of the diseases that I have is Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And so this was a global conference that I attended and it felt so wonderful to be around so many people who understood so much about, you know, the struggles of this disease. My friends, that is it. So I appreciate you spending time with me today, whether you're live or watching the recording. Um, I have homework if any of you think that that sounds fun. Um, first of all, contact me wherever you'd like. You can start at my website, scroll down to the bottom. You can see all my social media um, outlets, or you can just contact me, connect on LinkedIn, whatever. And let me know how you plan to incorporate um, inclusive, inclusive accessibility going forward. So something I always tell everybody, I say much love, uh, be a good human, and don't be a stranger because I would absolutely love to connect. And again, I see that I have many spaces here. I will fix this. <laughs> but if you want to find me online, um, my website is simply my name, bellagaitan.com. And my handles on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, and Medium are also just my name at Bella Gaitan. So that is it, my friends. Um, let's see. 
Bella, wow, you just knocked that right out of the park. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Carrie. <laughs> that was I've I was wrote it down because I love this. People deserve access to a psychologically safe space. Mm -hmm. Um that's so wonderful. Uh and thanks for just giving me some different ways to think about accessibility and who that applies to and, and what all that covers. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, um, we have a couple of questions. Let's awesome. see. Do you, <clears throat> ooh, excuse me. Do you have resources to suggest for finding diverse stock photography? Are there photography collections that are better than others for accessible diversity? Unfortunately, there's not a lot. I know that there are some, um, I don't remember them offhand. Um, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, I can send you the resources. Uh, personally, I just tend to go to like Unsplash or Pexels. Um, there's another one. I think it's called Pix. Is it Pixabay or Pexabay? Yeah, I think, I think yeah. so. Okay. I know it's, I know it's one of those. Um, but I just tend to type in some type of adjective like, you know, black person in wheelchair, Latina, uh, blind Latina, or plus size folks, or, you know, Asian elderly person and stuff like that. And it can be very tiring, you know, because like I said, you just, you, if you try this, I want all of you to try this, go to a website and type in diverse photos or diverse group of people or something. And you'll see what I said, you'll see, it'll be typically like 20 to 30 year olds, attractive. I'm doing air quotes for anybody that can't see. Um, and varying skin colors, but not like different body sizes, not differing abilities, not like, you know, people that are older or people that are visibly part of like any type of underrepresented group. Um, but yeah, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, I do have a resource saved. I can, I can forward that to you with some websites that do cater to more like, you know, diverse photos. Fantastic. Okay. So that's the homework assignment. Everybody email <laughs> their not so diverse, diverse photos to Bella. Yeah. <laughs> <Our post -moment laughs> um, another question. How do you have ideas for how people can discuss triggering language respectfully and safely? Okay. I guess, um, are they able to elaborate on that or because I, Let's see. Well, um, yeah, we'll give them a second to see if they if they okay. chime in with more. I think it because I'm thinking is it, is it like is it, yeah is is it like is there a way to talk about something that might be triggering in a better way, or is this about talking to someone about how not to be triggering with their language? You know what I mean. So I guess I'll start mm. to. Um, well, let's oh, see. there it is. Okay, I see it. The question is about okay. how to talk about triggering language without using triggering language so people in the conversation be, can be comfortable. Okay. Um, that's a tricky one. But if you, if you recall how I did it in this conversation, I was saying that, you know, people have traumatic experiences in the past. They have traumas they've been through. Um I didn't go and say the things. Sometimes you have to though. And what you can do in those situations is you can provide a trigger warning or a content warning and try to think of a way that um, you can protect folks. I'll give you an example. I have to change positions, people. So my head's going to be up in here for a second. Um, so I recently did um, a panel series at my work for our LGBTQ plus employer resource group. And one of the uh, people that I brought on is blind and his blindness was the result of violence. Um, so what we did in this, because he did want to talk about his story and how it happened is before he started talking about it, we told everyone there, we said, you know, this could be, you know, potentially triggering if you feel like, you know, due to violence, if you feel like, you know, you don't, you know, you're not able to listen to this, you know, turn your speakers down. And when we are done, we'll all just like wave our hands at the screen so that you know to, to look up. 
it was the only thing that we could think to do, you know, because in order mm-hmm. to like make a safe space for any people. Um, so sometimes you do have to get creative, but if it's a specific resource or course about a certain, a certain trauma or a certain, you know, issue, then I think just providing a disclaimer in the beginning that, you know, there's going to be discussion of triggering content, um, just so people can make that decision because we don't want to make it for them. Right. Because there are some people that have been through traumatic experiences and they're okay to hear about it, talk about it. They want to talk about it, you know, but there's others that, you know, it's just not psychologically safe for them. Um, I hope that answered the question. It's, it's, it's a little tricky to do. Um, but it can be done. Thank you. Well, maybe going back to your, your final point of be a good human. If you're trying to be Uh a good human and, and are coming from a place of wanting to be respectful, uh, then we can give some grace to each other while we're figuring things out. Like you said, the, the uh, gender uh, neutral language uh, I'm pretty sure the first session I moderated a couple hours ago, I signed off by saying, thanks guys. <laughs> I said it during and the just- talk too. And yeah. And, and like, we're all going to do that. You know, we're all learning, we're all growing and evolving. And I think the biggest thing is just like, apologize if you feel it's necessary and just try to do better. You know, right. it's just because, I mean, our, our brains are very complex and there's so much memory going on in there. Right that it's like a reaction. It's like a, a, you know, knee jerk reaction, you know? And so just, just try to do your best, try to be kind to everyone, be a good human like that. That that's my biggest thing. Like, just be, be nice. <laughs> just be a good person. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that would solve well, so many problems in the world. Oh my goodness. <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you, Bella, so much uh, yeah. for sharing your wisdom and your, exuberance and your lived experiences. I think it always makes things easier to understand when you have those real world examples and your, let's see, your DJ Norby seems like a pretty cool dude to hang out with. He's the best. Yeah. His (laughs) dance moves, nobody can compare to them. (laughs) Uh, Well, thank you everybody for attending this session. You can continue the conversation in the chat or on social media using hashtag WPA11 why day i just say wp ally and for anybody that doesn't know why it's got the the one the 11s in there there are 11 letters in the word accessibility between the a and the y so it's shortened down uh to that and there's also the hashtag wpad 2022 it would be fantastic if you could go to wp accessibility dot day slash feedback to provide anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentation, and you can enter to win a t-shirt while you're there. Uh, Don't go anywhere or go anywhere for just a few minutes. Take a break. Uh, Stay tuned for digital accessibility testing, how to get it right. Coming up next with Tamar Shapira at 6 UTC. And while you're waiting, don't forget to visit the sponsors page, grab some virtual swag, and enter for a chance to win prizes. We'll see you right here after the break.